Wow, as Jude and I stumbled across a hidden gem. Bolaru Central, South Australia, look it up. Great little spot. Um, if you're going through to uh, Wilmington or Jamestown, um, you've got the backdrops of the remarkable, Mount Remarkable, I think they call it. Um, and of course, we were over in Oruru not long ago. So uh, terrific little spot to come and see. Uh, well worth the detour if you'd like. Peace and quiet. Um, and a little hidden hidden gem. I'll tell you about it soon. Um, big shout out to uh, Craig and uh, Emma Waters. They've got an engineering business in town. Uh, we needed some internet and uh, he helped us out there because um, we only run Vodafone on the phone and we've got the Starlink in the trailer. So but you can't take Starlink in your pocket, can you? Um, now he runs that engineering business and incredible um, workmanship he does there for, for the farmers around here and some out of this uh, world type of machinery and things. So yeah, pop in there, say g'day. Um, there's the IGA and we've stocked up with some supplies. We also caught up with Ian. Now he's the custodian of this uh, little park here. There's uh, some artificial grass spots you can park at. There's power, there's water, there's uh, a dump site and there's um, showers and toilets further around the corner there. Now, Ian said, what are you doing for the rest of the afternoon? I said, wow, I don't have too much in the way of plans. Well, he whipped me over to the Bolaru Steam Traction Preservation Society and boom, totally blown away. That guy, well, the whole team, hey, big shout out to you. It's all volunteers. Uh, Ian's got an amazing passion and some uh, great um, history. Showed me toys that were, yeah, you watch this episode. So, right, I've made it over here. It's a windy day here in Bolaru, and the custodian of the, uh, the RV place we're staying at uh, offered me a, um, an invite over to the, uh, the Bolaru Steam Traction Preservation Society. So uh, he says I'm in for a bit of a surprise, so um, I'm really looking forward to see what he's got to show. Uh, I'd like to just point out to you that all these buildings were put up by voluntary labour. Everything that you see in the museum has been donated, even including the half million dollar steam engines. They weren't quite worth half a million dollars when they gave them to us, but they are now. There's no insurance, because uh, you can't insure it and something you can't replace. And it's all run by volunteers. Buru Centre is a non-government survey town in the Southern Flinders Ranges along with Melrose. All the other towns were government surveyed and they were surveyed on the square, North Terrace, East Terrace, West Terrace and South Terrace and they all had 1st, 2nd, 3rd Street, 4th, 5th and 6th Street. But Buru and Melrose were, were colonised slightly before that and the reason Buru Centre is because we have uh, two crossroads that met and then we had six or eight feeder roads into the crossroads, that's where everybody met. That's where the town grew up and they got water from a thing. The Bullaroo Township is surveyed out there on the side of the creek but it never had a house built in it. Now from there we're going to go over here and uh, show you a picture. The picture in the middle there is a whim, and that's where Bullaroo relied on their water supply when things got tough and it didn't rain for a while. And they drew the water out of that well. It was almost good as rainwater. If you walked down through the creek past the horses up the other side, you would have met my grandmother who uh, lived in a mud hut and cooked in a mud oven. And that's the sort of lifestyle they started off with. This is one of the very early telephone exchanges where you had lots of party lines, like three or four people on one line. My phone number was a short, a long, and a short, and I knew that was my phone to go and answer the phone. And then the neighbours on the same line also knew if they wanted to listen in, they could. Incredible. The blue scoop and the black plow, they are 77 years old. They're my toys. My grandfather made them for me when I was five. I asked the children when we come through, are your toys going to last 77 years? I'm getting any new toys. <laughs> this right here was my mother's and she cooked on that until she was 17. And then they upgraded uh, 
to a metal stove and that was all, oh, that was a wonderful improvement for the women to cook on. Windmills in this country after they um, discovered they could dig wells in certain spots. Uh, the windmill industry grew like Topsy and everybody wanted to make a windmill. Carting water is an absolute non-profitable job because as soon as your tank's empty, you've got to go back and get another one. The trouble, these sort of windmills in the early days suffered with metal fatigue and, and the heads and things all sort of fell off. And all right. The gentleman that decided to make this particular here, he might wanted a fan that wouldn't fatigue. So therefore, he made up his windmill with all these crossbars on it, which made it very, very solid and it, there was no metal fatigue on this one. This one come from America, and uh, but I maintain that the night before he designed it, he, bought, he drank a bottle of whiskey. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> he had a good imagination for some creativity on this one. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful, thank you for that. All right, something tells me going to make a major leap forward and look at that. Just before we get into tractors, we'll go back to history a little. We're going back to 1790, 1800s, and now you should be able to tell me what that piece of equipment up there in the corner is. Well, that's a trick question. It looks like a steam tank. No, it's no? not. <laughs> it's a shipping container. Think about it. Everything that came out to Australia was on sailing ships. What sailing ships have got plenty of water splashed around everywhere, right? If you didn't have your goods inside one of those tanks and sealed up, when you got out here from sending it from, Sydney, from London to Sydney, you probably got nothing anyway. Because it all either all gone mouldy or wet or gooey or something. That's why even nowadays you can go around and see a lot of those tanks still lying around in scrap heaps and things like that because they never went back and they were just turned straight into water tanks. Okay? Right. But there's there's thousands of them around. You ask other people tell you. There's thousands of them. Uh, one fella decided that he would go along and collect all the different lids and makers. So he collected all the lids and makers. The people from England are most intrigued the fact that most of those lids there were all made in London. So they're not hub gaps. <laughs> all hub gaps. Tractor hub gaps. <laughs> this tractor here belonged to a family just below Buller and Center. Uh, the father and son, they, they used it. It's done 11,000 hours, which is not a lot for a crawler, but they had to go to a rubber tire tractor because they bought some more land and you can't run crawlers down the road very successfully. So they sold it to a, a station owner up the other side of Hawker, and uh, one day Peter was sitting down the sun. He said, oh, that's our tractor for sale in the clearing sale. He says, I'll go up there and have a look at it. So up he went, and oh yes, he had the right engine numbers and everything. He said to the fellow, well, I'm gonna come up and buy that. And uh, so that's fine. Um, fortnight later, he's sitting at the breakfast table again, looked in the advertising and the poor fellow had passed away. He said, oops. Uh, so he went back to the station and uh, was having a look around it and these two ladies walked across the yard and uh, they said, oh, you're, you're the young fellow that used to own this track. Oh, yes. He said, oh, I'm thinking about coming up and buying it um, at the clearing sale. It doesn't go for too much. And uh, they said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but you can't buy it now. A bit awkward because we're going to give it to you. So they gave him his tractor back. That's <laughs> right. It's tractor. So the, it's a Caterpillar. What would it be rated as? I mean, oh, a little. 38, 40 horsepower or something. Yeah. yeah. But they were good, strong horses though. Here we have two international trucks. And you might think why we've got two international trucks is because we started collecting everything. But you soon learn that you can't collect everything. 
but they already had these two trucks and they have an interesting history. A chap just out of Angerston, he had um, these two trucks and he rang the Stephen Traction that survived out one night or wrote him a letter and he said, I've got these two trucks down there. I don't want the bankruptcy people to uh, get them, so I'd like to sell them to you. So they arranged it and four gentlemen in the club got to work and bought them and brought them up here. Uh, they did up one fairly early and the, the other one. But it was most interesting, 17 years later, the society got a letter from this same gentleman uh, asking him uh, if they, he could buy their trucks, his trucks back. And what transpired was that from going broke 17 years before, he'd become a millionaire. And then he thought he'd like his trucks back, but the committee said that we looked after them and improved them and made sure that they and got them going and all the rest of it. So they decided they'd keep it. He wasn't all that uh, worried because he knew that they were in a safe house and they'd been here for the last 30 years. Oh. And this one's an older one down here, obviously, by the looks of it, my gosh. That, that's a rare one because you'll have the radiators behind here. Here we have a TEA Ferguson. Now, this tractor proved to be one of the most popular farm tractors around for doing all the odd jobs and, and you've got to go back to the 50s and the 60s uh, and the early 70s because rabbits were a major problem in this area and they were great at ripping rabbits out the ground and all sorts of things and everybody knew about a Ferguson. So it was interesting that the agent in Oru sold 53 Ferguson tractors in one year. And uh, then back in the early 60s, the 70s, the people of Rundle Street, like the doctors, dentists, lawyers and accountants, all decided that they wanted a 10 acre block in the Adelaide Hills uh, as an investment or a, a weekender or something like that. And uh, that suited the local council down the ground because they soon slapped on all these blocks you had to remove all your box on. Sort of tracked into your boy, well everybody knew about a Ferguson. So they went out and bought Ferguson's, great little tractors. Unique pieces of equipment, but these tractors were the only tractors that I know of that came, didn't come with a standard drawbar. They came with a three-point uh, three linkage drawbar, but it wasn't standard. And of course, what the doctors and dentists didn't understand, they hooked the chain high up on the back axle and put it around to pull the box horns out. But if the box horn didn't want to come out and the Fergie wheels uh, dug in the ground, there was only one thing left to do and it tipped over backwards and killed them. And uh, with that, I must express that farming has always been extremely dangerous occupation and still is, regardless of all the modern um, cabs and all the rest of it, uh, little market garden tractors and all sorts of things that like that are still dangerous. This little tractor here is a Fordson. This is the most produced tractor in the world. They made something like 420,000 of these tractors spread all around the world. They made them in America, they made them in England and they all had the one trait. They all had worm drive differentials in them, which meant that they were dangerous to drive. If you were ploughing with this engine and the plough got stuck and the wheels couldn't spin, there was only one thing left for it to do, is the little worm round itself around the cog and the tractor went over backwards, killed the driver. Now, Henry Ford, come to the conclusion you can't kill or keep on killing your customers it's not good for business so what they did is they they that's the end of the original mud guard there they actually put another piece on down real down real low so that if the tractor started to tip up it would stop it it would lift the wheels off the ground and stop it from coming over so it's an early form of a dragster wheelie bar no, it was a lifesaver. <laughs> this 
is the field marshal tractor made in England. They started designing this in about 1939 or something like that. Um, you get, uh, and the reason that was because history says that in 1937 the Americans made a decree that they were only going to put petrol engines in all their uh, army vehicles because you can't actually go out to hold up a flag until the Germans stopped shooting while well, I went across and got some diesel <laughs> or something like that because it made it very easy because if you saw any can or anything that had fuel in it you knew it was petrol. So when you make petrol you have a byproduct of diesel. Now back in 1937 diesels were fairly difficult to start very very few of them you could get going by cranking them uh, you can crank these, but then in England, there was no men left. They're all at the wharf. So they had to make a diesel tractor that a lady could start. So that land, the land ladies or land army that they used to call themselves could go out and plough the fields and grow the food and all the rest of it. So to do that, the short story is, you make some adjustments, you put a 12 gauge cartridge in there full of black powder and all you had to do to start this track was hit that little button with a hammer and away it went and it worked really well. This this is the end of the tractor shed. We've got another shed down there with a hard 100 stationary engine and we've got some other sh engines over in, in our big engine shed uh, but we will miss on them today and we'll pick them up later. Uh, so I thank you for your attention and uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian.